Savar. Her life is a mess. Her drinking is out of control. Her husband, Ken, is addicted to pornography. Their teenage daughter is sleeping around. And their teenage son is smoking weed. Everyone sees the problem. But everyone ignores the problem. But every Sabbath morning, there they are sitting in church together like a big, happy family, acting as if nothing is wrong. They look like the perfect family. And sitting right behind Barb is Joe. Everyone loves Joe, especially the men. You see, Joe was a big-time college football player in the SEC. He has stories to tell of accomplishments, everything that he has done. But you see, when Joe is all alone, he's miserable. See, Joe pushes everyone away. Nobody can get close to Joe. His marriage only lasted six months. Everyone that has ever cared about him, he's pushed away. But that Sabbath morning when somebody asked Joe how he's doing, his response is, great, never been there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, I just ask that you send your Holy Spirit to touch our minds and our hearts. Give me the words to say that may lift you up. We ask that you continue to work in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, Joe and Barb, they've learned that church is a place where your game fades. It's a place for perfect people. You see, Barb becomes Barbie, married to Ken, the perfect little family. And Joe becomes G.I. Joe, the action hero that everyone admires but nobody really knows. But they're dying inside. You see, our churches are filled with Barbies and Joes because we have a society where image is everything. We have perfected the art of faking it. The reason why I love that video that we watched so much, we've shown it multiple times, the reason why I love it so much is because it is everything that we should be about as a church. It's about coming, whoever you are, however you're dressed, whatever your past, being able to come to the foot of the cross and meet Jesus. Last week I told you we were starting a five-week sermon series on the core values here at Triad Adventist Fellowship. And I told you that each week I'm going to tie each core value into our vision statement. Look, you'll throw the vision statement up there. The vision statement is to provide the Piedmont Triad with a Seventh-day Adventist community that presents Jesus Christ to the disconnected in a creative, authentic, and caring environment where everyone can grow to their full potential. Last week we looked at spiritual growth. This week we're looking at authenticity. When you look at that vision statement, it's where everyone can come to an authentic and caring environment. We need an authentic environment if we're actually going to grow in Christ. And you may remember last week I told you how we came up with these four values. We sat down around the table, we had a sheet of paper with all kinds of good spiritual values on it. Not a single bad one on it. And I told everyone to count their top five. And then we went around the table over a series of weeks and we said each person stated what their top five was and why they chose those five. Interestingly enough, authenticity was not on that sheet of paper. But it got the second most votes among the core group. And we can thank Andrea for that. Because Andrea was one of the very first people to go. And she said, here are my core values. But there's one that I really want on there but that's not on there. And it's authenticity. So we wrote it in. The right in that. And that authenticity got the second most votes among the core team. So even though you have a sheet with all kinds of lists on and all kinds of good terms, doesn't mean there's not one that can be added to it. So this week we look at the core value of authenticity. 
Isn't it sad that people often find more grace and acceptance in places other than a church? Quite frankly, if we come here this morning and we put on a good front and we pretend that everything is perfect and there's nothing wrong in our lives, we might as well have stayed home and slept in. But that's not what church is about. That's not what Jesus is about. When we stop being authentic, we become a social club, a country club. Many churches are dying as a result of that very thing. You see, authenticity is countercultural. Being the first person out in an authentic relationship is difficult. No one wants to be the person that says, you know what, I'm not doing okay today. My life isn't perfect. Nobody wants to be that first person, but the interesting thing is that if you are that first person, it's easy to follow when it starts. So someone has to be willing to start that authentic relationship, and then it's the rest of us just follow suit. And that's what we're hoping to do here at Triad Adventist Fellowship. See, authenticity is essential to our spiritual journey. If we want to grow in Christ, if we want to become like Christ, we have to be authentic. Because it's only through authenticity that transformation to Christ's likeness happens. So there are four reasons why authenticity is so vital to our spiritual walk. And to do that, we're going to look several places in the Bible, but we're going to focus on 1 John when we do that. The first reason why authenticity is so vital to our spiritual walk is found in verse. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. It's because we all struggle. 1 John 1 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We may admit that we had a past, we had problems in the past, but we like to talk about how right now we got it all together. That was the past. We're okay now. But when we do that, are we not subtly claiming the very thing that John is condemning there? That if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. If we claim that everything is perfect, that we have light, our life together, are we not deceiving ourselves? It's self-deception. You see, none of us are free from the struggle against sin. No, not me. Not you. It reminds me of Alcoholics Anonymous. Whenever somebody goes to Alcoholics Anonymous, when they start talking, the first thing they say is, my name is so-and-so, and I'm a recovering alcoholic. It often made me wonder why they start that way. They don't start that way because they're living in the past. They can't get away from the past. They're doing that because the reality is they're never free from that temptation. So today, I stand before you. My name is Matt, and I'm a recovering sinner. You see, when I was younger, many of you probably won't believe this, but when I was younger, I had a, a horrible temper. And I had a very short wick. I could be set off quickly. I lost a lot of friends when I was younger because of that temper and that short wit. You see, I grew up in a home where my parents loved me. It wasn't a bad home. We went to church every Sunday. I wasn't raised in Adventist. We went to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. A lot of church when you're a kid. But I never had a, a relationship with Christ. So when I went away to college, I started drinking. I started living a life I'm not proud of. That drinking led to some places that I'm not proud of. It led to a night in jail, which I'm not proud of. But my name is Matt, and I'm a recovering sinner. It wasn't until much later in life that I met Jesus. 
that my life changed. So I ask you this morning, are you pretending? Are you sitting here acting as if your life is perfect and everything is okay? Because the first thing we have to do, we have to be real. We have to admit that our struggles are real. But quite frankly, if I stand up and admit that I have a struggle, it makes it much easier for other people to do the same. And in fact, they may have the exact same struggle that I had, that I overcame, but they thought they couldn't do it without somebody else. So my struggle may strengthen others and lift other people up as well. That's why we need to be authentic. We need to be authentic because we can help others with their struggles. See, it makes me think of, we often think about emotions and anger, and I said, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't happy and proud of those anger and those emotions. There's nothing wrong with the emotion itself. You know, when Jesus walked into the temple and he saw them desecrating the temple, he fashioned a whip, and we call it righteous indignation, it would sound better. But he was angry, and he chased them out. And when Lazarus, his good friend, died, he wept. The emotions aren't wrong. Even Jesus had those emotions. So the second reason why authenticity is so vital to our spiritual walk is that, quite frankly, confession brings cleansing. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, John said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Did you catch that? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us. Some of our sins we will forgive our sin. It doesn't, there's no qualification there. All sins that are confessed to Christ will be forgiven. There's no sin that if we confess it, He won't forgive. If you're addicted to pornography, if you're a drug addict, if you're an alcoholic, if you're a murderer, if you confess that sin to Christ, he will forgive. We like to categorize sins. Well, that sin is okay. You confess that, it'll be okay. People will forgive you for that sin. And, ooh, not that. There's no clarification there. All sins are forgiven if we confess them. See, confession brings us cleansing from our sins. So don't cover it up. Don't pretend to be okay. Confess those sins. We find justification elsewhere in the Bible. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, James, the brother of Jesus, said, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The, right, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And then in Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Confessing our sins brings forgiveness. We find mercy. And it helps us have that relationship with Christ that we need to have. The third reason why authenticity is so vital to our spiritual walk is that, quite frankly, God already knows our past. So why are we trying to hide? First John chapter 1 and verse 10 says, If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Now you may say, well, no one actually claims to be without sin, right? No one claims to be without sin. But do our actions reveal that we're living that way, as if we don't have sin in our lives? You see, I sin every day. Every day I sin. 
I wish I didn't, but I do. So I stand up here with a stand up and say, you know, my life is perfect. I had a good morning. I didn't. I spilled stuff on my pants and I get my son to bring me another pair of pants. I thought it was going to be a good morning until I did that. It was a great morning other than the pants. But if I stand up here and make it look like my life is okay, my life is perfect, am I not claiming to have not sinned and thereby making God out to be a liar? You may recall last week we looked at Paul. Paul didn't have a perfect early life. When he was Saul, he persecuted the church. It would have been easy for when Paul wrote letters for him to ignore that part. That part that's not so nice. Just write about, oh yeah, I met Jesus on the Damascus, Damascus Road, and ever since it's been perfect. But in his letters that he wrote, he always included that past. One of the first books that he wrote was the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13, he said, You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. In his early letters, he focused, he started out with his past. And then one of his later letters is 1 Timothy, also chapter 1 and verse 13. Paul again says, even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul didn't ignore his past. So why did he write this in these letters? Why would he throw out there how bad of a person he was before he met Christ? It's just like that person in AA. He's talked about it to remind himself of how far he has come. I can see Paul saying, my name is Paul, and I'm a recovery. You see, when we act like we're perfect, we are calling God, in essence, a liar. God knows all of the details of our past. He knows every mistake I've ever made, every sin I've ever committed. So why did I stand up here this morning and tell you about some of my past sins? Is it because I'm living in the past? I wish I'd never remembered them again. I talk about it because... I don't want to forget where I came from. Just like Paul, I have to remember how far I've come to realize how much he has done for me. You see, the moment I forget where I came from is the very moment that I'm on the brink to repeat it. Just like the alcoholic, they're always a second away from taking another sip and falling off the wagon. I'm a second away from committing another sin and falling back into the life that I once lived. The fourth reason why authenticity is so important, so vital to our spiritual walk, is quite frankly, Jesus is enough. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, John said, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He, when it talks about Jesus, Speaking to the Father in our defense, it's an advocate. That's actually a legal term. We have a defense attorney, the greatest defense attorney that ever lived, there advocating for us before the Father. But you see, he's not doing what a lot of defense attorneys do, and I can say this because I used to be one. He's not sitting there begging for mercy. See, Jesus is there 
showing that the price has already been paid. That he already paid the price. And that his death covers all of our sins. See, Jesus Christ is God's provision for all sins. All of my sins, all of your sins. And interestingly enough, when I think about my position here at Triad Adventist Fellowship, all the mistakes I've made in the past, all the sin I've committed in the past, everything that I've done wrong in my life, God knew I was going to do all of that. But he chose me anyways to be here. Just like he chose all of you to be here, despite whatever your past may be. See, the key to authenticity is twofold. One, we have to be willing to be authentic ourselves and open up to others. We have to be willing to say, I struggle with X, Y, and Z. We have to be willing to do that. But the second part is just as important. We also have to be willing to accept authenticity from others. We have to be there for them and love them no matter what. It takes both. If somebody comes to you and says that they are struggling with something, it's not a time to say, okay, I'll pray about it and walk away. We often do that, don't we? I do that. That's the time to stop whatever you're doing and take the time and sit there and pray with them right there. And whatever it may be, to be an accountability partner. If it's drinking, say, I'm going to call you every night. And I'm going to ask, how was your day? Were you able to stay sober today? And praise God if they were able to. But if they weren't, not judge them. But pray with them again and say, tomorrow's another day. Let's start it all over again. It reminds me of many years ago, maybe a decade ago now, I don't know. Um, I was standing in the hallway of the courthouse talking to one of my coworkers. And she was telling me about how bad of a morning she was having. And she got a flat tire on the way to work. And just her day was absolutely miserable. She was sitting there telling me about it. And, and I was just standing there listening. I didn't really care too much about it at that point. But I was doing what I should do. I was sit, standing there listening to her bend. And around the corner comes another attorney. This is a more seasoned, very well-known, very well-to-do attorney. And he's the type of attorney that whenever he sees you, goes, Hey, how you doing? Good, 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 good. You have a good day. And then it rushes off. And he comes around the corner, and he sees us, and he does his typical thing. He says, hey, how y'all doing this morning? You guys doing good, good? And, you know, my coworker just laid it out there. I don't think he was expecting that. She was like, I'm having a crappy day, but it wasn't quite so nice language. And you could, you could tell, one, he wasn't expecting it, but two, I don't think he heard a word she said. So he was like, great, 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 you guys have a great day. And just kept on going. We've got to be willing to be authentic. She was willing to be authentic. But we have to be willing to accept authenticity. When you hear about somebody's bad day, you've got to stop and take the time to be with them. So, it's too easy to take it. It's easy to come here and get up and talk about how life is perfect and to be Barbie and G.I. Joe. It's easy to do that. But we have to be willing to let our guard down. We have to admit that we're not perfect, that we're real people, with real failures. Because when you do, and when you do fail, you have to realize that there are some people who are there, ready to help you, ready to help you back up, ready to help you experience God's forgiveness in your life, and ready to move forward with you once again. So my question is, are you ready to be authentic? 
It's not easy. It's not easy getting up here and talking about the things I've done in the past. But it's what we have to do in order to grow closer to Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that Triad Adventist Fellowship is a place where you can be real, where you can be authentic, a place where you can come and if you've had a horrible week, you can say, I've had a horrible week and somebody will actually stop, give you a hug, pray for you, talk to you about it. That's what I pray this church is, is that we are an authentic relationship, an authentic church where everyone feels that authenticity. So let's help each other to get there. I can't do it by myself. We have to do it together as a church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you did on that cross. I thank you for the sacrifice that you've made. Lord, I know that if I just come to you and I confess my sins to you, you will forgive them. Lord, help me to be an authentic leader in this church. Help us to be an authentic church where everyone knows you and where everyone knows that all they have to do is admit their failures and we will lift each other up. In your son's name, amen.